Three new candidates emerge in the ETSU head men's basketball coaching search. I'm going to tell you all about them. Hi, I'm Marky e. Bilson, and for the third straight day, the John City Press has nary a story in it about the ETSU head men's basketball coaching search, which is why you're watching this video and reading my stuff on Medium and so on and so forth. But in addition to interim head coach Jason Shea and New Mexico State's Chris Johns, the, the there's a website, it's called theballout.com. Okay, theballout.com. They report that Akron head coach John Gross, Florida assistant Darius Nichols, and Kentucky assistant Joel Justice, spelled J-U-S-T-U-S, -S, are all candidates now for the ETSU head men's basketball coaching position. I can confirm ETSU interest in Nichols and Justice, but let's go through these new these uh, new candidates. Then I'm going to tell you about the existing ones in Johns and Shea, uh, as they would still figure to be the front runners. But uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about the coaches that have absolutely no chance but are being talked about in this job here. First, though, let's talk about Gross. Uh, the intrigue here used to be at Illinois, and you know. There was some belief in 2004, ooh, ETSU is getting a coach who used to be at UAB. Well, Illinois trumps that a little bit, as you might imagine. Uh, but also, you know what? It shows how far ETSU, as well as its Southern Conference, have has grown. Because you're talking about a MAC coach coming to the Southern Conference, if Gross is the man. Uh, by the way, he uh, spells his name G-R-O-C-E, okay? So uh, doesn't spell it like Greg Gross, the former, uh, you know, pinch hitter for the Philadelphia Phillies of a generation ago. No, it's G-R-O-C-E, but pronounced like Greg Gross, okay? But anyway, but John Gross, you know, Mac coach, just keep in mind, NET rankings last year, Mac was number 12, the Southern Conference is number 13. The Mac has always been considered to be the superior basketball conference, uh, however, it's also an 85 scholarship football conference, kind of interesting there. The Southern Conference, just a 63 scholarship football con uh, conference. I mean, you're talking about the difference between FBS and FCS. Uh, now, think about that. That means that the Southern Conference is taking a step towards the Big East and the Atlantic 10. Now, they're not there yet. Don't, don't get me wrong. But it's a step towards that, because you wouldn't think twice if a Mac coach went from, you know, Akron or whoever, right? I mean, Bowling Green, that sort of thing, to the Big East or the Atlantic 10. Wouldn't give it a second thought. But, uh, you know, the Southern Conference, it's never been that way. But this shows you where the ETSU program is right now. So another thing about Gross, he was an assistant at NC State about 20 years ago when Les Robinson was the athletic director at NC State. Hmm, kind of interesting there. Uh, he most recently coached, at, has uh, coached, I should say, not only at Illinois and Akron, but Ohio. Now, keep that in mind, because you're going to look at Jim Schaus, the new Southern Conference commissioner. Where did he come from? Ohio. Now, I wonder, could Schaus have had anything to do with, hey, you know what? Uh, I knew this guy who, when he was coaching at Ohio, I hired him and he took the Bobcats to two NCAA tournaments and eventually Illinois hired him. And you might be able to get him at Akron. Hmm. Now, the search firm that lured Jim Schaus to become the Southern Conference Commissioner from being the athletic director at Ohio was CSS. Now, CSS also hired Tom Wistrasil as the Big Sky Commissioner. Where did he come from? Athletic director at Akron. Hmm. Now, it should be said that Gross and Wistrasil never uh, worked together at Akron. Wistrasil was gone from Akron before Gross got there, but it's still 
you know, th there are some tie-ins here that you never really knew existed before. Hmm, kind of intriguing there. Now, these two names I can confirm, and they are Joel Justice and Darius Nichols. Justice is an assistant at Kentucky. Nichols is an assistant at Florida. Let's go talk about Nichols first. I think he's a strong candidate. Uh, he has won. Now, he played at West Virginia for Bob Huggins and John Byline. Uh, didn't take part in the 2010 Final Four team. He had graduated by then and uh, wasn't even a graduate assistant with the Mountaineers. He started his coaching career doing that. Uh, but as an assistant, just like as a player, he's won. Because at West Virginia, he did play on a Sweet 16 team with the Mountaineers. Uh, but he got his first real assistant coaching position, not a grad assistant, you know, first full-time, that sort of thing, Northern Kentucky. And those are the days when Northern Kentucky was in the Atlantic Sun and beating ETSU. So, but that's not all. After that, Nichols went to Wofford under Mike Young. Wofford would win a Southern Conference. Then he went to Louisiana Tech. Louisiana Tech would win Conference USA. Now, for the last uh, three, four years he's been at Florida, he was part of the Florida assistant coaching staff that coached against Steve Forbes in the NCAA tournament. And yes, the Florida Gators, remember, defeated ETSU in the 2017 NCAA tournament. So that's a very interesting choice. Also, Nichols is local. Nichols is from Radford, Virginia, not far away from Johnson City, a couple hours drive, but, you know, Radford, Virginia. Hmm. Also, and I know race isn't supposed to matter, but uh, it does. Look, this is the University of Tristan Retke, and Nichols is the first black head men's basketball coaching candidate for ETSU, to my knowledge, since Derek Wittenberg in 1996, who was a finalist when Ed DeCellis got the job. So imagine, I mean, if there was any, uh, I, I don't want to say it would wipe away the Tristan Retke incident, but it might soothe some fears if, let's say, a recruit was looking up ETSU on the internet and wanted to know, what about this? Well, you know, Nichols might be able to soothe some of those fears, obviously. Uh, so that's that's a very interesting candidate right now. Uh, would be younger, would be looking at ETSU as a stepping stone, and not every coach would. Don't I know that there's this belief that ETSU is destined to be a stepping stone, and to a certain extent that is true. But not with every candidate. I'm going to get to that. It would be the situation, Stepping Stone, with Joel Justice. Justice is a pretty fair coach. Not only is he under the John Calipari, uh, how should we say here, uh, <laughs> under, maybe that's not the word to use here, but not only is he on the staff or under the tutelage, of John Calipari, and me think of my words to use right here, but he was listed with Nichols, by the way, just this month as one of the top 50 assistant coaches by Silver Waves Media. Now, Jason Shea was not listed among the top assistant coaches by Silver Waves Media. Now, you can easily say, well, what does Silver Waves Media know? Who are they? You know, all this, you know. And I would imagine that Silver Waves Media would be looking more at assistance in Power Six conferences in college basketball than they would, say, the Southern Conference, mid-major conferences. But still, Justice has a very interesting background. He's analytics heavy. And in fact, the analytics, he was first hired by Kentucky to just do analytics. He is now an assistant coach, has been an official assistant coach for four years. He has been on the Calipari staff for six. But uh, when Kentucky was 38-0 in 2015, he instituted a two-platoon system using analytics. Uh, and eventually Calipari liked that so much that he promoted justice to the assistant coaching position. So the one thing that I think is that you're talking about Kentucky here, and 
Who's to say that Kentucky wouldn't have gone on and won a national championship this year? I mean, I guess that would have been a, a possibility. But I want you to consider that thinking about a Kentucky assistant is really a step up for ETSU in this administration. You go back to 2003, yeah, it's 17 years ago, but you go back to 2003 when ETSU had a turnkey team to go to the NCAA tournament, the team of Fields and Wadud and Rhoda and such. Anyway, Ed DeChillis had gone to Penn State, and Jimmy Patsos was an assistant at Maryland, and he publicly clamored for an interview at ETSU that never came. ETSU ignored an assistant from the national champion. He was an assistant at Maryland. They ignored him to interview three candidates, you know, Dean Keener, Mark Sloanacre, and Murray Barto, who eventually got the job and such. Now, I mean, I could ar entertain arguments all day long and kind of believe that Murray Barto is a better coach than Jimmy Patsos, but don't you, you know, talk to the national championship assistant. That shows you how incompetent ETSU was around the time they were dropping football in 2003. And uh, the other guy they didn't interview because he got a bad reference from DeChillis was Tom Conrad. And I never quite understood that because even if he did get a bad reference, uh, here was a guy who had taken Charleston Southern to the NCAA tournament. He was going to be asked to do the same thing in 2004. The team knew him. And maybe you go and you do interview him since he's already in-house and just say, um, what about these allegations about from DeChillis? Why do you think he didn't give you a good reference? Tell us why you're the man despite this. Let him speak for himself. I don't know if Conrad ever got that. Uh, he became a scout for the Orlando Magic after his coaching tenure as an assistant at ETSU. But I mention that because here's Jason Shea, totally 180 degrees difference. Jason Shea, right-hand man to Steve Forbes, uh, gets the interview, gets the recommendation from Steve Forbes. So it is a totally different situation than what it was in 2003, quite frankly, you're now dealing with competent athletic administration, whereas before in 2003, you were dealing with incompetent athletic administration. You've come a long way, baby, ETSU. I guess that better fit a Virginia team. Uh, you've come a long way, baby, but nevertheless, it's kind of a dated reference when you think about it. Anyway, <laughs> Now, let's talk about the existing candidates. A lot of people, uh, Chris Johns, uh, it's been confirmed he is a candidate uh, by New Mexico media. Like I said, three days, no, no stories in the John City Press about the ETSU head coaching search. Uh, what I'm hearing, though, from my sources is that Jams is not really a fan of the location of New Mexico State, Las Cruces, New Mexico. Uh, it's very isolated. Johnson City can be isolated, but you... You know, Johnson City has the Tri-Cities Regional Airport. Uh, if you want to hop a plane and you live in Las Cruces, New Mexico, you got to drive to El Paso or three hours to Albuquerque or, you know, four to Tucson or something like that. You know, it's and so it is a difficult grind for a man who is now over 50. Uh, I also am hearing that while Forbes did publicly endorse his former assistant, Jason Shea, to succeed him at ETSU, he may have privately also endorsed Jams. Now, they worked together at Idaho 21 years ago. They also worked together at Wichita State. But keep this in mind, if Jams gets the job, it wouldn't be the first time that he actually replaced Steve Forbes. Back in 2004, Steve Forbes left Illinois State to become an assistant coach at Texas A&M. The coach that replaced him at Illinois State? Chris Jans. And so you got to figure with Jans, you know, they know each other. Uh, you got to figure that 16 years ago, maybe Forbes had said, you know, I know somebody here who would be really good. I worked with him in Idaho. 
Would he not do that now? Hmm. Uh, Johns also is 51. Johns is the candidate who might not use ETSU as a stepping stone. There is the Bowling Green incident. That's going to be big. And for the ETSU fans who, yeah, you know, I mean, uh, a night on the town for them is church on Wednesday, that sort of thing. They're not going to like Jans. But that sort of stuff does also seem to blow over sometimes. Here's the thing. With Jans, with the Bowling Green incident and also being 51 years old, his next head men's basketball coaching stop will likely be his last. So here's a guy who, if you thought, boy, you know, if Steve Forbes been able to stick around, he could make ETSU into a real powerhouse, so a, a mid-major that gets nationally ranked and uh, contends for the conference championship every year, that sort of thing. Well, if that's what you're looking at and that's what you want, then you got to give Jans a long, long look because he is getting older. He is kind of damaged goods. But he also has won the WAC for three straight years at New Mexico State and has a roster that is very reminiscent of what you'd see at ETSU. The big thing with Jans, ETSU would not necessarily be a stepping stone for him. It would be for almost all the other coaches. Now, with every day Jason Shea isn't named the head coach, it really, his stock goes down. There's no other way to put it. He is the best coach for the short term. And you can get momentum for that. It's less likely that you'll have, obviously, transfers. I mean, there haven't been any yet. And you got to think the ETSU players are maybe saying, hmm, let me stick it out before I get, let me see if Shea is the guy or if I like the new coach. And the fact that, oh, Forbes isn't here, I'm leaving, is a good sign for ETSU. So this is the argument for Shea. But still, the more coaches they bring in, the more you start thinking, boy, why don't they like Jason Shea? Who, by the way, also, uh, you hear a lot of, oh, he's a real good X's and O's guy. I don't know about the recruiting. No, everything I'm reading, Jason Shea can recruit. And Jason Shea has had an impact in recruiting the players that are currently on ETSU's roster. So again, if you think ETSU, and they ought to contend for the SOCON title next year, absolutely. Uh, And that is a very strong argument for Shea. It's why I would still hire him, even if maybe his resume isn't quite what some of these other candidates are. You know, we'll see that. But if I'm Jason Shea, I'm seriously considering pressing the issue. I'm seriously considering calling up Steve Forbes and saying, look, give me, put a contract on the table, tell me what I can make as your top assistant at Wake. And then going in and saying, look, Wake will pay me X amount of dollars. Just make me your coach for this amount, or I'm taking Wake. If my five years of service here at ETSU as the top assistant coach to Steve Forbes are not appreciated enough for me to get this job, then, you know, I'm going to go to Wake Forest. Because if Forbes and company are successful at Wake Forest, then Shea's got to think, hmm, two, three years, let's say three years, three years, I'm 50 years old, I could be in line for an ACC head coaching position. Yeah, if it works well at Wake Forest, if you turn it around that way. Now, if he limps to Wake after ETSU hires somebody other than Shea, then he becomes a weaker coach. He does not look as strong. Three years down the road, when possibly an ACC team might go, Hey, why'd they take that sleaze Jans at ETSU instead of Shea? They get the search firm to give him a microscopic look. But if he goes on his own volition, then he is the strong assistant. It's a risk for Jason Shea. Sure, I mean, you run the risk of, well, if you're going to take that attitude with us, 
Then again, you'd hope that ETSU administration can understand Shea's point of view. But like I said, it might actually be the best move for Shea to get a head coaching position, be it at ETSU or somewhere else. ETSU would likely have to pay another coach other than Shea more than what they would have to pay Shea. Likely. It's not, you know, cut and dry, but it's likely. They'd risk looking like they are stripping their team down and have a lot of transfers. They could risk that as well if they don't hire Jason Shea today or if they let him go to Wake Forest because, well, we had to do a national search and all this. So, that's the thing with Shea. I, I still think he's probably the best candidate out there, uh, especially for the short term, and the short term can lead into the long term. I do think Jans would be the most likely to stay at ETSU for a 10, 15 year coaching period if successful. But yeah, there is the feeling of, didn't you appreciate what was going on there at ETSU these last five years under Forbes and such? Now, Adam Nelson hoopdirt.com, who I used to have on my show a lot, uh, he's got some interesting candidates that he's uh, brought out. One was Kellen Sampson, assistant at Oklahoma. Uh, he Supposedly, Sampson is uh, head coach at Houston in waiting, but I'm wondering if Nelson knows something that other people don't, or just uh, he's not coming up. You know, if, if Nelson is trying to come up with maybes or something like, well, this guy would be good and all that. Uh, I wonder about Penny Collins, if that's not the same thing. Penny Collins used to be an assistant at ETSU under Forbes through the 2017 season, where, of course, ETSU went to the NCAA tournament. But here's a question. If I'm hiring a coach, why do I hire the assistant from three years ago and not the assistant now that has worked with the players that I have right now? Especially when that coach has gone 27 and 36 at Tennessee State. You'd think that ETSU is in a place right now they can do better than hiring a 27 and 36 coach. Why yesterday's assistant and not today's, I don't know. I think that's why you are not hearing a whole lot about Penny Collins and you're hearing a whole lot about Shea. Just not the last few days with Shea. And also, just for that token, uh, Nichols, the Florida assistant, why wouldn't you hire him over Collins? I mean, Nichols won that 2017 NCAA tournament game. Penny Collins did not. Now, there's one coach, though, that is being mentioned that is in absolutely no way, no shape, no how, this isn't going to happen. And, you know, do if it does happen then, you know what, shut down the university. I mean, it, it's forget the basketball program, shut down the university. It would be absolutely an absurdity. It is a name that is reminiscent of when the local yokels used to say, hey, ETSU should hire George Petzl's their head coach. And that name is Mike Morell of North Carolina Asheville, UNCA. I have nothing against Morell. He actually was a guest on my show uh, before, but as I said, this is the, I think they ought to hire George Pitts uh, mention of the day. Let me tell you that when Morell became, he's from Elizabeth, and that's the only reason in the world that anyone is considering Mike Morell. And the only people that are considering Morell are fans in the Tri-Cities who are not aware that there is actually a world outside of the Tri-Cities. It is the idiot East Tennessean who says, well, I think Mike Morrell ought to be the coach. He inherited the Big South Champions regular season two years ago. He came in, everybody transferred. Now, this is what ETSU does not want, is anybody to transfer from the team they have right now, but certainly not mass transfers. Nobody wants mass transfers. That's exactly what happened when Morrell got the job at UNCA. He won four games his first year with a team that the year before had won the Big South Championship. He has won 19 games 
in two seasons against 43 losses. You've got ETSU, who just won the Southern Conference tournament and regular season, went 30 and 4, and you think you can get away with bringing in a 19 and 43 coach? No. So what if he's from Elizabeth then? The one thing about Morrell, there isn't another college in the country, not a D1, maybe a D2 or a D3, but not a D1 that would hire Morrell as a head coach. Not one. Now, maybe he will turn it around at UNCA. For his sake, I hope so. I enjoyed talking to him in my interview with him a couple of years ago. Have nothing against him. But he's not the right fit for ETSU. And it is the absolute townie, George Pitt should be the coach, suggestion that Morrell should come to Johnson City. That's I'm sure he would like to. I mean, I would, you know, like to be, uh, you know, dating Jennifer Aniston right now, but nevertheless. Okay. Let's go look at uh, this. If you enjoy these commentaries and right now in this analysis, right now it is the only place, I think, to really follow the ETSU head coaching search then this is what I want you to do. I want you to subscribe to my YouTube channel. I want you to follow me on Twitter. I want you to hit the bell on the YouTube channel. You're going to see a lot of videos for my work uh, and for what I've been talking about on the ETSU head men's coaching search, but you'll also be able to, uh, for instance, find and listen to my interview with Tom Wistrasil. To, inter uh, to hear my interview with the Southern Conference Commissioner uh, when he got the job, to be able to hear my interviews with Les Robbins, you know, this sort of thing. I've got an ETSU page. It is got more, it has more than 200 videos, something you want to watch. Uh, and really, this is the place to follow the ETSU head men's basketball coaching search. So, until next time, and we're doing this every day, I'm Marky Bilson. Look in the future for uh, one candidate that I'd like them to consider. They probably won't, but I'd like to see this guy. And one guy I'd like to see possibly become an assistant at ETSU. I'm Marky Bilson.